So we're going to work through a problem solving an indeterminate axial member using the force flexibility method. Now the videos will have this problem solved two different ways. One way using the stiffness displacement method, but now we're going to talk about using the force flexibility method for this. And the important caveat here is that this problem includes temperature based displacements and uh, induced loading as well, which adds a bit of a wrinkle to it, but it's not too difficult to incorporate that. So to introduce the problem, all the given information that we have here is that we have an assembly that's fixed between points A and B. We have three different distinct materials and uh, members. We have a steel member, a brass member, and a copper member. And each of those has a varying value for the length, the cross-sectional area, and the modulus of elasticity. So the three different components of stiffness are all varying. And also the, what we call the coefficient of thermal expansion is also varying between the three different materials as well too. So these were given in the problem if, we didn't, if they weren't given, uh, say the diameter, diameter was given, we could simply easily calculate the cross-sectional area as a result. If we were just told what the material was and not what the material properties were, you would just look it up in the back of the Hibbler textbook. And all that we're asking uh, for in this problem are the support reactions at A and B. And so I've shown an assumed direction of the support reactions at A and B. Uh, if we were to draw them in the other direction, then we simply would get a, a, a different sign um, for the support reactions. So if we're going to follow the force flexibility method, we have a very formulaic way that we go about solving that. And so step number one, which is where most of the heavy lifting gets done, is looking at compatibility. <clears throat> so if you remember from the force flexibility method, analytically what we do is we use kind of a straw man approach and we say, I'm going to remove one of these supports to turn this into a determinant system. And once we remove one of those supports, we look at two different loadings on that, what we call a primary system with a redundant support reaction removed. So we're going to remove the support here at A, and then we're going to create our primary system that no longer has this support, but we're going to look at two different loadings to be able to calculate what kind of a reaction at A we're going to need to solve, uh, to get the displacement at A equal to zero. So we're going to remove the support at A. I'm going to draw the same system just without the support at A. So we still have the fixed support at B, and I'm actually going to draw it two different times, and I'm going to add the results of each of these two different loadings together through superposition. So we have the same member, we're analyzing it a second time, we call the primary system without that support at A that we took away as what we call redundant. And we're basically saying that this system right here is equal to this primary system with a specific type of loading plus the primary system with another type of loading. Those two types of loading are relatively formulaic how we apply them. The first loading that we look at is the external loading on the member. So here I take a look at the assembly and I see no external loads whatsoever. What we mean is it could either be an external axial load, which we have none of, or it could be a change in temperature, which we do have here. So here I go from temperature one of 12 degrees centigrade to temperature two of 18 degrees centigrade. So we have a delta T of plus six degrees centigrade. We're gonna apply that to this first primary system and we're going to keep track of the displacement at A. So I'm going to draw my displacement in the positive sense. Displacement at A due to the change in temperature. So again, the, the, the fiction that we've created here is that there's no support at A. So if we took away the support and we heated this up six degrees, we want to figure out how much would this assembly want to expand. So let's just say that it expands one inch we know that in reality it expands zero, so we need to add something here to be able to push it back that one inch. 
So once we've calculated how much it wants to expand, we need to apply a force down here to mimic the support reaction and we can back calculate the magnitude necessary to completely counteract its desired displacement due to the loading. And so here I'm going to apply my support reaction. And so the support reaction is R sub A applied at point A and we're going to keep track of the displacement at A due to this redundant support. And so I'm going to draw my deflection using the assumed positive direction, which would be expansion. And so I'm going to keep track of the displacement at A due to that redundant support reaction that we've applied here. And we know that these need to cancel each other out. So based off these two primary systems, I can write the equation of superposition, which relates the deflections, which is why we call it compatibility. And I can simply say that our compatibility equation is that the change in length due to the change in temperature plus the change in length due to this redundant support reaction have to add up to zero. And so delta at A due to the change in temperature and any other external loading, in this case we only have the change in temperature, plus the change in length at A due to the redundant support reaction is equal to zero. And if you wanted to, you can move this delta A due to the redundant support reaction. You can move it to the other side and give it a negative. Either way, it's going to be the same exact result. And so now we just need to figure out what the equation for each of these terms are going to be. And we'll look at each of these different primary systems and loading separately to figure that out. So here, I'm going to calculate or, or write out what the displacement at A due to the change in temperature is going to be. And we're fortunate here because the only loading that we have is just due to this change in temperature. And we know that our fundamental equation for the change in length of a member due to a change in temperature is just the coefficient of thermal expansion times the change in temperature times the original length. And because we have three different discrete materials with different lengths here, all that I need to do is add up the results from each of those. So this is simply going to be an arithmetic summation of alpha delta TL for the steel, the brass, and the copper completely separately. So in other words, this will be alpha delta TL for the steel plus <clears throat> alpha delta TL for the brass plus alpha delta T L for the copper. If I wanted to, delta T is going to be a common value for each of these. It's all going to be plus six degrees Celsius, but just to be verbose, I'm going to leave it as it is. So we've essentially already figured out this term right here. It's just these three separate terms all added together. And that's going to be a discrete value. I have alpha for each of them in my given table. I have delta T. It's constant for the whole problem, all three members. And I have L for each of these. That's part of my given table as well. So I'm actually going to get a discrete value for this. It might be 0.1 millimeters or something like that, but I'll get an actual value. And so this second term is going to be there to counteract all of the results of the change in length due to temperature. And so we're going to have an unknown value in the second term. We're going to figure that out from this second primary system with the redundant support reaction applied to it. And so separate the board a little bit. And here the change in length at point A due to the redundant support reaction. The only type of loading that we have right here is a force. So we're going to get an internal normal force in each of these members. And so this is going to be equal to the sum of NL over AE for each of these members. Again, L, A, and E are going to vary. Then we just need to figure out what is the internal normal force going to be. It's going to be an unknown value, but we need to relate this externally applied redundant support reaction to what the internal normal force in either the steel, the brass, or the concrete is going to be. So just to break this out into each of the different terms, we're going to have NL 
over AE for the steel plus NL over AE for the brass plus NL over AE for the copper. And so we just need to relate the redundant support reaction to each of these internal normal forces. That's really easy to do. I'm going to make a section cut in the steel here and make a free body diagram so I can go from the external loads to the internal loads. My free body diagram, I have my section cut right here. I'm going to draw my internal normal force in the steel pointed away from the section cut and I'll still have my redundant support reaction R sub A out here. If we have a coordinate system, if I sum the forces in the X equal to zero, I get R sub A plus the normal force in the steel is equal to zero. In other words, the normal force in the steel is equal to minus R sub A. Because there's no other externally applied loads here, I'm gonna get the same exact result if I make a section cut through the brass or if I make a section cut through the, the copper. All of those are gonna be equal to minus R sub A. So I can substitute that in here. All of these will be equal to negative R sub A. And again, note that that negative symbol would be different if my assumed direction of R sub A was different. If R sub A was pointed in the opposite direction, R sub A pointed in the opposite direction, all of these would be positive R sub A. Again, it's just a uh, result of the assumed direction of that force. I believe when we worked this out in class, we used a different assumed direction, but we'll get the same exact result. It's just that um, the relative direction is gonna be uh, different based off the sign. Okay, so now I have all the rest of these terms. I have L, I have A, I have E, and I can take these three terms, put them up into this equation up there. The only unknown that I have anymore is the support reaction at A. And so to combine these two equations together, I'm going to have uh, the change the displacement at point A due to the change in temperature will be these three terms right there. So I'm going to get alpha delta T L in the steel plus alpha delta T L in the brass plus alpha delta T L in the copper plus these three terms plus NL over AE in the steel plus NL over AE in the brass plus NL over AE in the copper is all equal to zero. And again, the important part here is that all of these internal normal forces is equal to minus R sub A. That is my only unknown. I'm not gonna go through the process of entering in all of these values right here but again, the important things to keep track of is that we change everything to be in the same unit system. So we should change the length into meters and we should change the area into square meters instead of millimeters. Instead of gigapascals, we should say 10 to the ninth pascals and the uh, one over degrees Celsius is fine because we're gonna be multiplying that by degrees Celsius. So we plug all those values into this equation and we solve for R sub A and we'll find out that R sub A is equal to positive 4.2 kilonewtons. And because it's positive, we know that we assume the correct direction for the support reaction. If we had assumed the support reaction pointed in the other direction, we would have gotten a negative value but it's the same result. So, and this is all the problem was asking us for was the support reaction at A and B. The support reaction at B, just based off of statics, I'm not gonna go through the equilibrium equation, will also be equal to positive 4.2 kilonewtons. So here's our final answer. 
If you take a look at the stiffness displacement method for the same problem, we get to the same exact result. We essentially have all the same terms as well. And you'll see in that problem, or that way of solving the same problem, the compatibility step is really where almost all the work gets done. This last step, where we calculate what R sub B is, that's just based off of static equilibrium. And that's kind of step number two, which is, again, the equilibrium step. So for force flexibility method, we look at compatibility first. That will get us all the way to solving for one of the unknowns. And then we can just use equilibrium, free body diagram to solve for any other internal or uh, support reactions, internal forces or support reactions.